could join us. Thank you uh, for coming here. Um, I'm not sure uh, uh, if you have been to Noesis. Have you been to Noesis before? No. So, um, well, I'll introduce Noesis. Uh, so, I have kind of a combination of topics in mind, and the area is too broad to cover in 45-50 uh, minutes. So, I'll do some sampling of the things. Um, even in our center itself, we have a large amount of, a large variety of activities going on that involves sensors and Internet of Things and such. So um, I put a few terms there, uh, Internet of Things, and particularly the application-centric perspective, because I don't want to talk about devices and hardware uh, and networking that much. Uh, physical cyber-social computing. Uh, I'll describe that later on, and there's something called semantic sensor web. Just as a uh, introduction, let's see. Ah, I thought it was working. All right. Well, uh, so um, the Noises Center, um, I moved here in 2007, and this building was built uh, uh, at, the, at that time. And um, we were given this floor, and then we have grown beyond that. You might have seen the name Noises uh, out there. In the, uh, you know, we have signed there. And we are. Uh, nearly 100 people, uh, about uh, 15 or so um, faculty, uh, rather multidisciplinary. Um, so we have computer scientists as a score, and then we have biomedical researchers and professors, and clinical, a lot of clinical collaborations, cognitive scientists, um, uh, and, and some others. And uh, 45, 50 PhD students, and then masters and uh, undergrads and such. And um, uh, for uh, some uh, an organization that is a little bit new, uh, I think we have a lot to um, sort of uh, talk about. Uh, we work uh, in the area, as you can see, in the semantic web, uh, an area of uh, application of semantics to the web-related data. Uh, we are the largest academic group in the U.S. Um, and we do a lot of work with social data, sensor data, mobile cloud, and co co so-called cognitive computing. A lot of big data to smart data, internet of things, clinical, health, biomedical, DOD, and intelligence applications. A lot of industry collaborations, our students work there. They have fund, some of them have funded us. Google, IBM, Microsoft, uh, HP have uh, given us grants or, or, or gifts. Um, and our students are really uh, extremely successful. So, um, uh, you know, this is just one of the... in. Um, in the world, we rank among the top 10 in the 10-year impact in the area of worldwide web. Web is a big area, very important area of computer science, and um, we do fairly well. On the five-year impact, uh, uh, we were sharing second places with uh, CMU among all the universities in the world. Um, and that, that might come as a surprise, but we really have something very world-class here. Um, very well-funded by National Institute of Health, uh, NSF, uh, some AFRL, um, could be more, uh, and, 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 uh, and DOD funding, so AFOSI and others. So let's talk about, um, uh, so everything works except for this button that is supposed to work. So um, there are um, increasing number of gadgets today, right? All of us have these smartphones. number of laptops and computers, right? And we significantly ex exceeded that. So there are um, major, for the first time in the history of humanity, more people have single tool or device than not, right? So never in the human history did people have the same device, uh, mobile phone, uh, and the majority of people in the world had the same device, right? Um, now, in a couple of years, majority of the people in the world would have a smartphone. So uh, there are $100 smartphones sold uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, this is without contract. Ah, we have pizza. Oh, wow, that's early. To interrupt your uh, Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that <laughs> is again changing. The same way you saw the shift from computing to these little devices. Uh, so the smartphones, that is changing to devices. So almost everything that is coming out on uh, in the market uh, that uh, measures something, that observes something, uh, that um, you know is a sensor in your car, 
earlier there used to be these sensors that are used for um, uh, indus in industry, machine to machine kind of communications. Now these sensors are talking uh, with internet or, or, on, or on internet and hence on the web. So that has fundamentally changed the situation um, and the, um, the numbers are mind boggling. So for example, uh, this uh, video graphics, let's see if uh, I bring up. Is from internet and you can oh, sorry oh, from Intel, and here you can see. So you can see here, the numbers are mind-boggling. So around 15 billion such devices today, and probably growing to 200 billion in five years. Per user, 26 devices. The kind of industries where you can see them deployed. Devices of all different varieties. We are doing a smart city project with the with European Union. Some exceptionally interesting um, applications there, and a lot of other things coming up, right? And uh, let's see. I don't know if this video is going to open. If it will open, I will will see. If not, no big deal. withdrawal at an ATM, every voicemail recorded, stored, and retrieved, every card swipe at the turnstile when entering the subway. Each of these transactions and many others generate data that is analyzed, replicated, and consumed. We call this the digital universe, a measure of all this data along with a forecast of its expected growth to the year 2020. In 2007, IDC and EMC have studied this digital universe, tracking the sources of data creation, the technologies used to create it, and the socio and geographic trends that impact its rapid growth. One significant trend, the digital universe is entering the fourth major migration from analog to digital. First came computers. Then phones went from analog to digital, then cameras and media, and most recently, machines have become major sources of ones and zeros, the digital bits that make up the digital universe. These new digital machines, spewing fresh and ever-growing volumes of data, are what technologists call embedded systems. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole of that, but um, let's get and it's a nice video and some uh, wonderful uh, data uh, that is there. Uh, but um, the issue then is with all this data, we will get lost in us, you know, with the, 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 the massive amount of data. This, uh, this picture that I had picked up a while ago, the fires of data coming, what you need is something actionable, useful, right? For a single person right now, uh, it, theoretically, there's so much data out there that you can use. Your phone can guide you through the traffic, your uh, sensors can measure all things related to your body. This all data can be created, will continue to be created. And yet, uh, our brain uh, decision making power is not increasing at any such rate, right? And so we need to get to the human the decision maker, we make a decision, we act upon uh, you know, the information that's around us. We really have to get something that is quite useful, right? Uh, personalized, contextually relevant, actionable information. So that is 
a key thing that in the, one of the biggest challenges that we have. All right, so let me start with this broader thing <coughs> called semantic sensor web. Yes, we have sensors everywhere, and that one of the things that we face, and this is a old a topic, the stove piping of uh, uh, systems, right? We talked about it for, I guess, decades. Um, but the same problem is once again coming. Earlier we used to talk about different databases not talking to each other. Well, right now devices and their app builder, application builder, they are not talking to each other, right? So that problem is still there. The thing is though, the variety of data that is created is even more challenging, even more numerous and diverse. The amount is again even more voluminous than ever before. So. Um, um, we want to kind of set that data free, and that means that we want to be able to discover, access, search, integrate, and interpret the data. That leads to this concept we had introduced in 2008. That's a term that we brought out called uh, uh, semantic sensor web. But before we get to semantics, there is this sensor web where um, all these obviously devices are on the web, right? The issue here is that we want to have advanced cyber physical application to improve situational awareness. Right? Um, uh, again, that the concept of uh, actionable information, situational awareness, all these basically are talking about saying, can I bring all the relevant data in uh, and interpret in the context of my application, my need to make a decision, right? Um, so, um, uh, there are, um, with regards to the sensor web, there has been a variety of activities that have happened and I just want to recognize them. One of the major group is OGC uh, and uh, OGC has developed something called sensor web enablement framework. And the idea about this framework is that they wanted to use service oriented architecture and be able to communicate data that are connected, um, that are collected by sensors through uh, services infrastructure, so typically XML based messaging. Right? So you can have a service architecture where um, a sensor is, uh, you know, you can find which sensor uh, uh, is accessible on the network. You can uh, find what kind of data they can provide. You can get the data in XML and then use it in your application. So that level of things had already existed, uh, was developed about four, five, uh, you know, about a lot of activities was done about five years ago. Now, um, let me talk about one interesting concept beyond uh, the fact that we can actually get to the sensor and actually get the data. The idea, the problem, the challenge is to get from data, which is so large. So this is a big data problem, the five Vs that we talk about, right? Volume, ve uh, velocity, veracity, variety, those kind of problems, to something that is meaningful. So um, here is a, a question we can ask. One single flight. Uh, from uh, you know, uh, old, you know, from one coast to another coast, creates 240 terabyte of data. Now, what do we do with this data? Do we have capacity to um, uh, process this data? And um, you, you know, what does it mean to process this data? Well, pilot would have need for only certain information from all this data, and convert. You know, you, nobody is going to. Looks at, look at bits and bytes, right? Or think about the mechanic that puts the scope in at the end of the flight and say, did anything go wrong? So from all this massive of data, amount of data, you want to be able to simply find that relevant data where something could possibly might have gone wrong that you may want to act upon, right? So they, that is the challenge. Not the data, amount of data, not the data collection, converting all that into something that human needs to pay attention to. Just uh, in 2008, we lost the ability to store all the data that was collected. And so there is now a lot more data that is collected than we have capacity to simply store. The interesting aspect, corollary of that is that we should not be thinking about uh, building applications that um, say, okay, store and forward. Put it in a server and then I'll do processing. That kind of processing that we developed a couple of decades ago, that won't work. We often might have to uh, process things in real time, and what we did not process is gone forever, because a lot of it can't be stored, right? 
um, uh, and um, uh, um, so and the other thing that here it is that what happens here is that you observe a lot of things. All these data come, keep on coming in. Um, the concept that I would like to uh, put forward is called perception, meaning right now in this uh, talk you are uh, a lot of recent bites are hitting your uh, you know your brain right you are you have kind of video going on that you are observing you have uh, you know text that is there that you are processing you are converting speech into something and understanding that right and at the end of the day you take away something you remember something you take away something that is the human capability to perceive to convert massive amount of these bits and bytes that is around you, that you are, that is hitting you, and convert that into something that is very meaningful to you. And that is, by the way, different for each of you. Each of you are processing that data with respect to your own past experiences, your own cognition, your own um, knowledge of the field. Some of you will hear, look at, because you have networking um, expertise, you look at, pay attention to that part more. Some as data processing, you pay that part more. So each of you will take something away. That is a very important uh, capability, this perception capability. And uh, uh, you know, so you need to be able to create that uh, kind of stuff. So the important thing would be, again, coming back to that example, how much of this data that is generated is regarding uh, the health and well-being of pilot or passengers? Right? These are very important questions. These are the kind of things that uh, we kind of uh, have not yet been able to answer. All right. So now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to some of the things here. Um, one thing that we had to do is to figure out and build an infrastructure so that we can deal with all the kind of sensors out there. Right? And for that, we, um, I had uh, started uh, and then co-chaired a, a group at World Wide Web Consortium, a standard making body uh, called Semantic Sensor Networking. And in that group then, we developed so-called Semantic Sensor Networking Ontology and a scheme to annotate the sensor data. So the idea here was that you have all kinds of uh, sensor. We had one uh, uh, AFL funded project where uh, we had IP camera, we had, um, uh, you know, GPS. We had, um, uh, 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 we had a gas sensor. All this data were there, and that data, all those data, had to be used in the context of a particular application. And the challenging thing would be that each of the manufacturer come up with a different format of representation of the data. Even if they were to give the data in XML format. They still won't be. Uh, it will still won't be able to possibly. Uh, you can't still connect uh, some information about something you are seeing on the ground here from one sensor with uh, something coming from another sensor, right? So all that heterogeneity or variety that is there had to be handled somehow, right? The other is that um, uh, the system need to be made aware as to the capability of the sensor. And the, if that is possible, then this, we can build smarter system. So we ended up. So what what we ended up doing was to develop a very comprehensive modeling of the sensor systems. And I won't go into the uh, you know detail. For example, there is modeling accuracy of the sensor, modeling name location location of a sensor, and so on and so forth. And um, there are a whole bunch of concepts. You have single sensor. You have uh, sensor systems, you have uh, sensor uh, tolerances, you have sensor data types that they create and so on and so forth. Fortunately, uh, and it was pretty significant international effort, we were able to um, create um, uh, this ontology and now this is very widely utilized uh, in the world. So there are quite a few number of systems that have been built and more and more are being built uh, using this um, uh, uh, thing. What we had been able to do, for example, in our, um, these are just some of the projects uh, that adopted this um, uh, semantic sensor network ontology. Uh, we were able to build this infrastructure where we can even dynamically incorporate a new sensor in the ecosystem, in the application ecosystem. So, uh, in our application scenario, and I, I have a video, but I, I suspect I won't have time to show you. 
uh, we are a person is walking about with his iPad, and uh, then um, uh, he's asked to introduce a gas sensor, which takes the uh, so the sensor is registered into the system. It takes the reading. The scenario was a gas plume because of uh, you know fire at a, uh, a chemical factory kind of thing. So um, uh, the idea, uh, the the, cons the description as to what exactly that sensor is about, and what kind of data it is providing, all that could be described using this ontology, right? All right. Um, now uh, one of the um, other thing that uh, we did was to uh, kind of demonstrate that it is possible to take sensor data and put it out on the web for uh, standard use uh, through some standard protocol. So there is something called a linked open data. Uh, you might have heard of this open government uh, initiative. And uh, increasingly, the open government data is being put into a semantic uh, web data format, uh, an RDF. Um, uh, you know, uh, language-based uh, representation of the data. Uh, so right now there are uh, literally a thousand plus nodes out there on the web. And this node, some of the nodes create very high quality data. For example, uh, you would see, uh, uh, you know, here in the center, this DBpedia. This DBpedia is the uh, structured representation of what is in Wikipedia. Right? Uh, anybody who uses a web search engine would know, uh, you know, there is many of the, many times the results come from a Wikipedia, right? So Wikipedia has a lot of knowledge that is created by humans, uh, and now I can uh, extract that knowledge in structured form, and I can put it there. So, for example, there will be there is a page on Wikipedia that says Dayton, and the Dayton has this many, uh, you know, uh, major major institutions and these art things and you know AFRL and uh, Wyatt Patterson Air Force Base and all this stuff. All those concepts are that there as part of Dayton on Wikipedia. All of them are present in a structured form, kind of database form, and put up there in the Wikipedia. Right? That means I can now uh, use uh, use that as a database to understand a number of terms that uh, that I come across, let's say in a plain text. So we have put up here in the Noesis here. You can see Noesis linked open data. Data about uh, uh, some billion, uh, two billion, I believe, uh, triples, uh, meaning observations, uh, related to seven major um, uh, uh, natural, uh, you know, disasters like hurricanes in the U.S. Now the point here is that that such data is put up there, and uh, others can use it and analyze it and so on and so forth. So um, um, uh, and then we could do um, a query like saying that. Give me the information, uh, weather information, um, uh, at a sensor that is closest to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So you, in a search, you just type here, um, or, or, or the other data international airport here. So you are typing uh, data international airport just like as you do in a Google, and uh, the system finds out that there happens to be a sensor right there, and then it shows you, you know, where exactly the sensor is. And then you can uh, look up uh, current observations, right? So latest observation that has been collected is made available on the uh, web. So what is happening here? Here there is, happens to be a whole bunch of sensors. Uh, for example, we have tapped into 20,000 uh, sensors that is part of MesoWest network in North America. And then for all of them, you can find out the data that you uh, like this, right? Beyond the fact that you can search and get the latest reading, you can develop more advanced applications. For example, we have developed applications that will say, uh, where you can ask, during uh, this time period, in this location, was there any blizzard? Right? So if you think about it, it's not, not easy to ask these kind of questions and, because you have to find uh, what sensors had reported data, uh, during this time frame and these, uh, you know, uh, uh, locations, spatial, temporal, thematic queries. Beyond that, you had uh, to do reasoning or complex processing that says, what is a blizzard? So blizzard would have certain visibility, uh, minimum visibility, uh, uh, or, 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 you know, maximum visibility, rather, certain speed uh, of wind and uh, certain level of precipitation. All those rules will come into picture, would be applied to this data and all that. So what, what happened here is that rather than raw data uh, coming from one sensor, you have the ability to get data from many sensors 
and then it convert that data into information uh, in, at, uh, at a level of abstraction like Blizzard, right? Uh, so we had built applications in weather, like the example I just gave you, rescue, like the example uh, related to fire at a chemical plant, let's say, and in healthcare. So, um, uh, in, in I'm going to be bypass some of the things here. So here is a um, there's a robot uh, there, and we mounted a bunch of sensor on that, and the uh, uh, robot was taken to different types of fires, and the uh, application would tell you uh, what kind of fire that is. It's a wood fire or chemical fire or water fire. So different kind of sensors can help you, uh, uh, you know, identify that. So the point here is that that raw data from a singular sensor, carbon monoxide reading, temperature reading, IR reading, all that get converted into a fairly high level interpretation, like the type of fire that you want to be able to recognize. Uh, in this case, this is that example of dynamic uh, mobile sensor uh, devices for sensor data process processing. I was talking about the iPad thing, that kind of stuff is there. And in that context, some of the background knowledge came from this knowledge base, right? So, in, in, when a human uh, looks at something, uh, when uh, when human, uh, you know, for example, uh, gets the data, it usually inter interprets that data. And in interpreting that data, human is able to use all the knowledge that person has. Or you can go and search Google and uh, find some additional information to further interpret data. These systems are being built whereby I'm, I'm getting the data, but this whole processing uh, thing I'm not going to describe in detail here, but I'll be happy to later on, uh, is utilizing the data It's already out there. The, in fact, knowledge that is out there, like background knowledge that is out there. right? So th this makes for other powerful application building things. And there are reasoning things that we are talking about here, where uh, this is basically uh, that application I'm talking about where uh, it's a visualization of a new sensor that is authenticated, uh, that is conveying this, uh, this service here called SEMSOS. So SEMSOS is a sensor observation service. This is coming from uh, uh, OGC's um, uh, sensor web enablement framework. And we created a, a semantic version of that. So instead of having data in XML, the data was more interpreted with regards to the model or ontology of uh, uh, relevance to an application. Right? So data was, and that data coming from different sensors where uh, it was possible to integrate them uh, better. So there were some uh, sustainability applications. So uh, here one of my students uh, uh, did, uh, went to IBM in uh, India and they did uh, uh, kind of uh, an application regarding traffic uh, using this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, semantic sensor web kind of stuff. So I'm going to you know, bypass that uh, given the time. Reasoning over the traffic, mm -hmm. so you quantity reason like given an event, find routes that are affected, quantitative reasoning, complete, complete delay probability and order, uh, order routes, right? Um, uh, there was a, a whole thing, uh, you know, infrastructure here, I won't discuss that in detail, but you can um, kind of get a sense of what kind of stuff uh, you can do here. I, I will probably show you something a little bit later on. So let us move on to a, um, a health uh, uh, related application. This is an area where we have done um, uh, uh, probably the most uh, appli uh, work, uh, health, transportation and um, uh, potential intelligence applications. So let's look at this brief uh, video. We've been thinking about digital health or, and also mobile health for some time. And uh, the idea here is that how can technology assist in addressing some of the health challenges. My name is Amit Shed. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering, the LexisNexis Ohio William Scholar at Drive City University. The knowledge enabled techniques and particularly what we call semantic web techniques. Uh, so NOIS is probably is the largest academic group in the United States in semantic web research. So these techniques, semantic techniques, enabled by background knowledge and other traditional techniques like machine learning and NLP, natural language processing, they are playing a very important role in being able to make sense out of all that data being created. Among the things that we noticed we could do well and uniquely is to use low-cost sensors, computations on the mobile phone, and making the health-related decisions, for example, how much risk you have for the onset of a disease 
right on the mobile phone. Everything is done within the control of the patient, so you avoid the privacy and security issues that come with the health data. Uh, we are working with uh, Dr. Shalini Forvis, uh, who is a pediatrician, but an expert also in children's asthma. So she is, uh, she is giving us the medical knowledge, and we have developed these application that runs on mobile phone that uses a whole bunch of sensors, um, as well as uh, some of the data on the web. For example, what is the pollen today? What is the smog level today? In-house humidity and temperature, uh, patient's own situation like wheezing, all these are collected and then uh, the system automatically analyzes these things and uh, tries to warn if the chances of uh, asthma has increased. So we are talking about data to information to meaning and we get to the way. So, uh, uh, we uh, have done this with ADHF, uh, acute decomposite heart failure. Uh, this is a project with Ohio uh, State University's Medical School, the Chief of Cardiology Medicine, uh, Dr. William Abrams. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we have this application with uh, asthma, you, I just talked about there. This is a big data problem, right? Uh, you have. Uh, variety of sensors, a lot of data continuously being created, uh, you know, the data keeps on changing every day. And from all that data, you need to be able to convert and ask this a high level question. What risk factors influence asthma, asthma control? What is the contribution uh, of each risk factor? And, and how can we, what can we do to avoid asthma episodes and things of that nature? So, the, uh, you know, uh, in this context, what, what we do, is you have a bunch of sensors, and you can see a whole bunch of different data, personal level signals, public level signals. So for example, here uh, we are getting um, web services uh, to give us uh, the pollen count, or uh, we, you know, smog level, or things of that nature. And population level signals, meaning uh, the hospitals are putting out the reports saying there is more occurrences of asthma at this uh, time. Or CDC may give out uh, the kind of stuff. All the data, Plus, we have the domain knowledge, uh, so we uh, have um, understanding of the protocol that uh, asthma uh, doctor, doctor, you know, treating asthma uses uh, when can you use a particular um, medication, as an example. Uh, and then um, the then you analyze all that data, and um, uh, at the end of the day, and there is a lot to this analysis. I'll come to that briefly. You want to be able to get what is actionable. Take medication before going to work. Contact doctor. Avoid going out in the evening due to high pollen levels. Things of that nature, right? This just is, shows the kind of knowledge that gets uh, modeled in ontology. I'm not going to describe all those details there. But the point here is that this is what doctor does. So doctor looks at the asthma control and severity level of asthma. And if you have mild persistent asthma that is not well controlled, then you give medium uh, inhaled corticosteroid. This kind of knowledge has to be built in. Now, any application you have, uh, whether it is a transportation application, whether it is military application, um, uh, one of the things we do to build these intelligent applications is that you model that. I use in, you know, we use the term ontology. Many of you might have heard of that, or, or you just you can call it background knowledge. And that knowledge is always applied to interpret the data and convert that into information. So uh, here you'll be able to convert that data into how control is my asthma or uh, uh, how vulnerable is my control level today. Right? So latest information and what could be there that could uh, you know, adversely affect my health uh, in this particular context. 
And I'm going to, uh, uh, the point here is that while the, you collect the data like pollen level or your temperature or your in-house um, uh, dust level, what matters is a number of things that relate to the human, right? Uh, so what is the gazing level? Uh, what is the exposure level over a day? These are not single observation, something that are cumulative and aggregated. And then all that processing ultimately lead to kind of uh, decisions saying that, you know, uh, uh, there is a, uh, th there is a uh, carbon monoxide ingush during the daytime. Uh, that could be the reason that, uh, you know, causes asthma at night time. A little bit about the framework, how this works, a slight repetition, all the sensors, you see the sensor modalities, all of them come with different forms of data, right, from different manufacturer, some of them are analog data, some of them are digital data, some of them this, for uh, tab, uh, tab limited form, some of them are XML form, all of them, this is your application model and this is domain, and so the doctors are interested in these kind of concepts, pollen level or chest tightness or things of that nature. So then what happens is that inter the system that we build uh, basically tags all this data with these concepts in a uniform format. So this is what, uh, this is the format that comes from our use of the semantic sensor networking ontology and annotation frame framework, right? labeling the data. By the way, this labeling of data is something that is now very widely done. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in today, uh, uh, if you do you know, Google search engine, for example, has adapted uh, something they call Google Knowledge Graph. That Google Knowledge Graph is similar to what I call these ontologies here, right? And uh, that Google Knowledge Graph has the uh, same kind of knowledge as that DBpedia has. Uh, they initially started by buying a company called Freebase that had five, uh, uh, I think, a million facts. And then they are continuing to add now increasingly automatically. In 1999, I had started a company, and in fact, there is a patent that was filed and awarded in 2000 and 2001, the first patent with the word semantic web title, for search, browsing, personalization, interactive marketing um, that my company had. Uh, uh, and that patent talked about use of background knowledge to uh, do semantic variants of all these search and browsing and all these applications. Now, Google is also doing that. But the fundamental thing that there is is that you have knowledge, and you are taking the data with regards to that knowledge. So you're labeling the data. You are, you know, and that 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 means that data becomes more meaningful because the data is interpreted with all the concepts you have in the knowledge base. Well, that, that's the model there. That, are you going further than the tags, or are you just classifying according to the tagging? No, no. There is a lot. We see the model has richness, right? Right. So, so for example, uh, you are talking about, let's say, a disease. Then I would, the, my model will have all the you know, drugs, I would have so, all the test used for that thing, all the range of attributes for the labs that are appropriate or not. Uh, and, uh, but somewhere in there, there's the model that cuts it down to what you're actually going to see. Right. This is the model <coughs> in this case. You see this conceptual model, uh, this is the ontology. Okay. And this ontology in this case is for asthma. Similarly, when we work with the cardiovascular disease, we have cardiovascular ontology. We have another application with VA, VA hospital on GI surgery, and we started working on another application uh, for um, uh, advanced age patients with dementia. Uh, and there we are looking at, you know, so there again you are modeling uh, things. And, okay, so uh, it's a model, and this is in the form of a graph. Um, rich form of graph, is. yes, rich form of graph. And then, how do you convert that to a decision? Uh, the decision um, uh, is uh, by use of a variety of technique. For example, uh, in the, uh, I'll, 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 my next slides, right, come, brings us there. So, this is the semantic web, by the way, this is, my, uh, let me, um, uh, in the next, next few slides, I'll come to your uh, answer to your question. So, this is, by the way, how that W3C semantic sensor network looks like. This is an important slide. So, here you start with 150. That's what sensor gives you. Then you label. Here you are saying that this is a systolic blood pressure of 150 mg. Then you say this is elevated blood pressure. Sorry. Elevated blood pressure. Okay. Right? Now, unfortunately, that is not good enough for doctor to give, decide what drug to give. You need to have a diagnosis before. Uh, and that is, in this case, maybe uh, uh, the diagnosis is that uh, it is hyperthyroidism. Right? Now, based on that, 
because elevated blood pressure can be in hypertension or hypothyroidism. And the drugs for each of them are different. So this is going from this data to uh, something that is actionable. This is actionable, right? Actionable information. Now, how do we do that? So we do that using this, uh, in this case, Intelligo, which is our um, patent pending uh, work. Uh, and the idea here is, as I mentioned earlier, this concept of perception, I mentioned, right? And um, in cognitive science, um, people have studied this uh, extensively. And they have developed several cognitive models for that, right? So, um, in this case, um, this perception cycle, uh, generally a broad model, is um, consists of an abductive phase. So, from the data, you create a hypothesis, and then getting a deductive phase, collecting more data to validate the hypothesis, right? And and uh, that cycle here, uh, so you have uh, the top level of the cycle, uh, translating low level signal into high level knowledge, and then. Uh, focusing attention to those aspects of the environment that can provide useful information that can allow you to make a decision. In all this context, in our technique, background knowledge plays a very important role. One of the reasons why we, so, so many of you have, you know, have uh, either, either heard of or known or used technique of machine learning, let's say, right? But the machine learning is uh, about um, converting, uh, you know, dealing with the data. Right? And the um, anything that is intelligent there is basically the training set which human gives, right? And then that training set is used by the algorithm to do some you know build classifiers. Mm -hmm. right? Now um, uh, there is a, uh, another a well known uh, professor in that uh, his name is Pedro Dominguez uh, at um, uh, at Washington. He made a nice statement. He says data alone is not enough. You need a knowledge. So majority of the machine learning, for example, is focused on the data aspect. And by infusing the knowledge, we are gaining something very significant, uh, big, big power that I'm talking about. So uh, here, for example, in cardiovascular thing, uh, this is how the knowledge gets modeled. So these the concepts are in that busy graph that I showed you. And this is a fact of knowledge. Describe with regards to that busy graph of how do you model uh, sensor data. Collection of these is a form of ontology here. In this case, it's shown as bipartite graph. In other cases, you might have probabilistic information, other things like that. So the complexity of representatives can, there can be different complexity of representatives depending upon the applications. This is the same thing, but for a weather. And then you have this uh, uh, cycle uh, of thing going on. I won't discuss again in this detail, but for example, you have, uh, you are at the stage where something can be explained by hypertension or hypothyroidism. Then, the focusing mechanism would, you know, say what more is available. Oh, it says there's tiny skin. Then it says wall. Well, it is this and not that. This, this is a reasoning thing. This is an example of reasoning that helps you cut down from very large amount of data to few information pieces of information that you can act upon. Uh, owl is a one technique. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, owl-based reasoning is a logic-based uh, reasoning technique, uh, inferencing and such that has been widely used in some discipline. Uh, it has its uh, pluses and minuses, significant minuses. Uh, in this case, when we applied to our problem, um, uh, it quickly blew up. And we could take the data on a big server on a cloud and say we have massive computation power and we'll process it there. We didn't want to do that. In this case, health data, we wanted to keep it on mobile phone. So we had to come up with a bit vector based mechanism to, uh, um, uh, 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 to do the reasoning uh, in an entirely different form. And this uh, was, uh, and we call this intellis, intelligence at age. Many, my devices here, a soldier carrying a device in the field will have significant computing power uh, on his or her mobile phone uh, to analyze a lot of data that is being collected around him or her. Right? That kind of stuff is uh, very exciting. Uh, that's what we have developed. Uh, so you could do uh, what was, uh, you know, uh, you know a high complex thing into linear, High complex polynomial into linear and what took minutes and hours into milliseconds and so on and so forth. So we basically were able to do translate low level data into high level knowledge. Uh, prior knowledge was very important. I didn't, you know, I kind of showed you the knowledge, but didn't exactly describe the role of the knowledge, and that we can do the intelligence at the edge. Similarly, now I should wrap up. Uh, we do things with traffic. Um, and uh, uh, here, um, increasingly, I'm finding an interesting class of applications I call physical cyber social 
uh, you know, uh, computing applications. Uh, physical, meaning there is some data necessary for that application that is, uh, you know, observed by these devices, by the Internet of Things. Cyber, because there is all this knowledge on the web or other pieces of information on the web, like DBpedia or that uh, ontology on the web. That is applicable in making uh, sense out of the data. And social, because there are people out there uh, observing things and talking about it right now, as we speak, like Twitter, right? So, in the case here, we, uh, you know, we took data, uh, this is part of a uh, large EU project, and we are the US uh, partner in that EU project, and we have data from number of cities there, smart cities uh, data. And so here uh, we have this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, transportation issue, and so we took data from San Francisco Bay Area, and we got these millions of uh, data uh, samples uh, from, um, uh, you know, for the three year period from the road sensors. And um, we got a whole bunch of uh, things from the web, active events, uh, like uh, on the web you have things about um, uh, 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 traffic redirections and uh, you know you are going to have sports events and some stadium and so on and so forth. <coughs> and you got tweets. Now think about uh, uh, you know uh, in two two winters ago we had a big accident uh, right at this uh, exit 15. And um, uh, sensors may, you know, there's, there are sensors, there are videos and all that, you know, bakaitraffic.org, you can go and see some of the videos also. But very often, uh, um, uh, the sensors by themselves, other, uh, except for human looking at that data from sensors, would not be, you know, that data would not be meaningful automatically to, to make automatic decisions. But the person uh, may tweet, and in that case, we in, in fact, we found somebody had tweeted, there's a traffic at the exit. exit and big, uh, you know, uh, slow down. So, uh, uh, I got a human, uh, we call, I, I use the word citizen sensing, to make sense out of sensor data, right, combine that. So, this is what we are doing here. So, we are combining data from uh, the sensors. You know, you have seen applications and shows you this thing in color, right, that's coming from sensors. And you have the tweets. So we combine those things and build uh, very comprehensive applications. This shows, for example, and we do extensive, uh, today my talk is not about uh, social data, but we do extensive work with social data. Right now, JK Floods is going on, and as we speak, uh, major um, uh, work is coordinated, just coordinated by one of my students who is working on uh, the uh, projects there. So, uh, and the real lives are being saved uh, using the sites that we have put up. Uh, so now Google, yeah, and uh, Twitter and all these are part of the activity that uh, my student got started. Uh, but uh, here it shows that in the Twitter I have, these are the city departments. So they, 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 this is social programs, this is uh, administration, this is uh, traffic alert, this is uh, health uh, related data. And you know, so there's a lot of such data available. We can classify and say what the data is about and then connect with the relevant sensor data. And I'm, I'm not going to pass some of these uh, text processing and other things here. I'm not going to talk about that. But here I'm kind of, um, you know, getting uh, combining uh, the data from the road network and sensors with the data from the web, with the data from the uh, social media, and then, uh, you know, helping uh, make these kind of uh, decisions. Uh, background knowledge is also used. I showed you that kind of uh, here. And then um, uh, here I'm able to find out complementary data, meaning one piece of data gives complementary information, a social and sensor, a collaborative data, and, uh, and you know, and then help you make uh, timely decisions. So uh, there is a, sensors tell you about fog, and uh, uh, social data tell you about slowdown, and things like that. Uh, and you combine all of them together, and you get a very good situational awareness of this kind of stuff. So uh, let me leave it at that. Um, and uh, you know, open up for um, uh, questions. Data quality. How you deal with that? Data quality. Um, so that comes under this uh, point of veracity that I also mentioned. Um, data quality is a you know, very broad question. We have to look at individual type of data. Uh, if you're looking at sensor data, 
there are a variety of issues that come. Uh, one is the provenance, meaning in the modeling of the census itself, uh, you have modeling of the uh, tolerances of those devices as an example, uh, the physical surrounding related information and the control of the sensor kind of information. Uh, so you have those kind of stuff. Uh, we also do a, a bit of work uh, with regards to uh, veracity of data on social media, uh, whether the, uh, the, the tweet is trustworthy or not. For example, during Hurricane Sandy, uh, there was a guy named Comfortably Smug, and he tweeted about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Con Edison is, uh, you know, so electricity is down, da da da, and he was really uh, spreading rumors. And uh, uh, Con Edison would say that information is wrong and such. But how do you automatically identify uh, people who might be, uh, you know, giving unreliable or, in fact, uh, factually adverse data? So I think, you know, again, we have to look at individual type of source of data, and then you handle them. Um, uh, among the techniques kind of thing, in addition to simply capturing this uh, in, uh, information about the source, you also have to think about the techniques. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, uh, there are reputation-based techniques. Uh, there is old-time things, uh, Bayesian models and such. You also incorporate uh, probabilistic uh, information and kind of put a say that I believe it is X person correct or so, and then incorporate that in your reasoning mechanism to ultimately do that. So, uh, it's a complex problem. There's a whole variety of things. In fact, currently I'm doing. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an editor's chief of a journal. And the latest issue in print right now is on data quality in the area of this kind of this kind of things. Well, Which so journal is that? Huh? Which journal is that? International this? Journal of Semantic Web and Information Systems. Yeah. If you send me email, I'll send you the link to those. Well, that's a problem that humans have. Yes. You know, somebody comes and tells you the wrong story. I've known a lot of people go a long time with the wrong story. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. If and that's the mark to be, well, okay, we got a lot of interesting dynamics going on. But you might be able to get the sensor network that's smarter than a person. Well, because I, I, if, I, I, if you I put in the test for, for <coughs> people can be trained, say, where did I get this information? Do I really believe this? But most average people, when they listen to stuff, they kind of believe everything they hear. Right. So, so, so I think you are going more towards cognitive science uh, aspect of. Um, uh, you know, this data quality, uh, I was, in my answer, more talking about computational uh, compare of that. Uh, sometimes you have to bring both of them together. Um, that's why we also work with cognitive scientists so in psychologists. And, you know, uh, uh, but I, it's just a very complex one. We can discuss it. Yeah. What kind of security do you put around the application? You know, to take the asthma example. You know, you want that to, to give good results. And if somebody can hack the application, they can make uh, get poor results, regardless of. In other words, you have to protect that model so that they would change the, in, in the implementation. Well, yeah. Um, so here's the thing. I think uh, the, the, that this, the question of security you asked has been around for a long, long, long time, right? I mean, we talk about the network security. We talk about encryption. We talk about many, many other ways to deal with them. The same thing applied here. Recently, there were, you know, there have been demonstration of hacking into Internet of Things. So this is a well-known problem, as much as well-known as uh, network security is a well-known problem, as much as the data security is a well-known problem. I have not seen personally anything so unique about Internet of Things security as I have seen in the network security and data security world. Uh, I can talk about multi-level security. I can talk about encryption. I can talk about physical security. I can talk about, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, but you know, the, basically, you will do the encryption as the basic thing to to get started. Yeah. The uh, head question. We can. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's go to the question. But we can get the pizza started by okay. the end. Yeah. So, so related to uh, <coughs> earlier, you showed a, a model, and then you had, for example, the case of has or asthma. So pollen count, tightness of the and some other, and it appeared to have you know, some sort of structure available to the data. Yeah. Well, how much, uh, how is, uh, how, there could be influential factors that are not well understood by anybody. And to what degree is there anything in the way of some kind of adaptive modeling or discover, the, where the modeling itself has the purpose of discovering what are the unknown contributing factors that there may exist, 
which could help explain it. anomalies where the, the model of somehow, mysteriously, if you will, is not representative in all cases. It maybe represents 50% cases as well, and then 25% it's always wrong this way, and others, you know, et cetera. Yeah, this is, this is a very good research question. Um, I, um, uh, so, um, just like your knowledge and my knowledge is not complete, uh, absolutely the, any knowledge base that humans build is not going to be complete. Um, and uh, absolutely we, the good thing is that humans um, have the ability to learn new things uh, and that's very powerful and by and large um, in a computational world that kind of thing is slow in coming. That to identify where your knowledge gaps are and to um, incorporate them. And uh, this is a wonderful question you ask because we have done um, what I believe is to be exceptionally good progress, technical progress in this area. So I'll explain to you. We use this Intellego mechanism that I described, uh, as I just mentioned, kind of uh, to uh, find new missing uh, and new knowledge uh, and enhance our ontology. And uh, the specific application where we applied is um, uh, in the area of, um, uh, here's the application. So, you have electronic medical records, mm. and uh, when you go to, let's say, hospital or doctor's office, uh, at the end of the day, they have to produce a bill so that they can get reimbursed. Mm. And bill uses coding scheme, uh, and the coding, current coding scheme is called ICD-9, and they are moving towards something called ICD-10, which is more than uh, an order of magnitude more complex. So um, one of the wonderful things about uh, our work is that a lot of our work is with real world things. So in this case, uh, there is a collaboration with a small company that has funded us for the last four years, and they have made a commercial product out of the uh, research that we have done. And so this company develops e uh, uh, computer assisted coding. And uh, so the idea is that from the text, mm -hmm. uh, we have to do NLP, uh, and, uh, and then uh, map to this complex graph and say what is the most likely code that descri is described in this particular case in electronic medical record. Now, uh, what we did was to, this, we built an ontology, this knowledge base, uh, but uh, we realized that the knowledge base uh, can always be extended. There's always something that is missing. So we use Intellego when we find a new fact. Uh, so, so we have NLP techniques uh, in conjunction with this um, uh, reasoning thing. And uh, when we find this fact, and that is not in the, one node is there in my, uh, you know, triple, other is not. We collect them and we have techniques to then uh, rank them as the pot potential uh, candidates for new facts uh, that could be added. And then we have curation, so the ultimately human uh, uh, you know, expert is presented with all the possible missing facts and the human says, yes, add this to the knowledge base. And this is how we created a, a continuously uh, maintained uh, ontology and uh, you know, uh, knowledge base. Kind of thing. On the last point then, at this point, the common practice is, is there is a human in the loop relative to this update, yeah. which a note is in fact added in contrast to enough confidence is established algorithmically such that it is automatically or it is somehow integrated in the, in the model as a, as a lesser node, you know, a, a node with a lesser stature than the other nodes because it was automatically discovered yes. and could, then could be Yes. Later. Yes. So you can. For you can elevation to full mm -hmm. node status or something. Yes. You can. Uh, you can. You can um, uh, put a level of uncertainty, uh, and uh, in, in your model representation, you have uncertainty modeling. So human created, uh, curated, uh, agreed by the entire scientific community would be, uh, you know, what, let's say uh, near one uh, kind of thing. But uh, these kind of automatically things are candidates, and they are marked as such. And then you may still use when others cannot interpret the things. Mm -hmm. Usually what happens is the simple thing, like there are some immutable trade-offs in the life. In our first programming course, you would have learned uh, speed and um, uh, space, uh, time and space trade-off. Uh, similarly, uh, another uh, trade-off is uh, 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 expressiveness and computability. Mm -hmm. The more expressive the thing, more complex uh, the computational uh, and, and things are. And in your case, uh, this example would be that uh, if your domain is extremely well defined, uh, more can be automated, and if it is uh, broad, like a healthcare or even single disease, then uh, it cannot be as much automated as humans are necessary. Because I I'll give you another very interesting example. Uh, you heard of this IBM Watson, right? Uh, the one uh, that uh, defeated Jeopardy champions and all. So um, 
Watson is now, uh, you know, IBM is really working hard to use Watson for life science, uh, particularly clinical healthcare application. Uh, so they have a new division called Watson for Healthcare. Uh, in fact, three of my PhD students are working in that uh, very prestigious part of um, uh, IBM, and they are applying to cancer, for example. And the published literature, so I, I'm talking about uh, what is already known. And um, uh, I think that there was uh, uh, statistics that uh, at Anderson Cancer, which is the largest cancer you know center in, in the United States, um, uh, the uh, oncologists were uh, correct only 50% of time in their uh, diagnosis. And they claim that Watson is correct 90% of the time. But the point here is that um, I think the old days where human care are the final judge uh, are kind of gone. Uh, uh, meaning there are uh, routinely in the uh, healthcare area. That's why we take second opinion, third opinion, mm -hmm. right? And and routinely, uh, and it's not. It's, after taking a second opinion, it's not clear to you whether the first guy was right or the second guy was right. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's routinely uh, the case that we have to deal with these situations where uh, it's very hard to know uh, uh, what is correct. But when humans have such hard time doing it, uh, I would be a little bit uh, more cautious to let machines do all the things automatically or let it do it in a small uh, and narrow and well-defined area where there is more likelihood of success. Yes? Uh, one question. Uh, I'm trying to uh, understand how you combine the, uh, the, the, the probabilistic inference with logic inference. I can think about like your sensor web. On the sensor level, a lot of time the uh, conclusion from the sensor, uh, whatever the information extracted, is not very, uh, it's not deterministic. It, it, it's like, hey, because the sensor data may not be crystal clear. I thought this is maybe 70% or 80% chance this is a woman. How you take that kind of uncertainty into the high level of your reasoner, you know, about you know the this, uh, about making some decision, the kind of reasoning uh, with other context information, you know, because say there's one part of facts that is not deterministic. So how how that so basically uh, starting with some basic thing like uh, our reasoners, uh, logic based reasoners. There are both probabilistic and fuzzy, uh, you know, variants of those results that are out there. They, uh, there are two major, you know, uh, problems with things. First of all, the problem of coming up with the properties in the first place itself accurately and consistently, and other is the scalability of these, uh, result, you know, uh, these techniques. Uh, so they, they are there, but the, you know, literature has, and um, and in fact, um, uh, in our traffic application, we are using probabilistic reasoner. Uh, and so if you're interested, send me, uh, give me your email and I'll send you the paper that discusses in further details. But yeah, you had to model the things uh, that were not 100% uh, certain. When you say prior, does that mean you do Bayesian modeling? We use Bayesian models, so in the case, yeah. yeah. Bayesian models the uh, So you have the bi model. biased analysis based on what else you know about the problem. Even though you're only 80% sure it's a man, you know other things. And then what is... What is your limit when you make a decision? How much? Well, usually when I see decisions made, it's just a likelihood ratio. But it sounds like you, in a lot of cases, you want to be a lot more certain than that, like the disease. What is my limit of the uncertainty level that I can do? Well, if you had to choose between heart disease and heartburn, I, mean, I wouldn't want you to choose something because it was 51% heartburn. You know, I'd want you to be a lot more certain of it than that. How do you deal with that? Well, that, that should be part of the algorithm, right? I mean, they would allow you to uh, factor in the different levels for priority and then say, well, I... That's just the threshold this. level? Because the results are also not certain, right? But the moment you are going to start with the things, the results are always going to also carry qualities. Is that just a threshold level, you said? You can level, uh, put a threshold in some techniques so that well, the results will be beyond, you know, above of that threshold, but you can do it. So, is a so we need to end the formal part of this meeting, excuse me, and um, you can keep on the informal part uh, as long as you're not going to shut his body, willing to stay and answer questions. I wanted to thank you uh, and give you a little small, very small token oh, of uh, thanks. our appreciation, a little IEEE. Um, Good. Um, Good. Uh, help yourself some pizza. Um, so, uh, uh,